Hi, this is something new that I'm doing. It's doing lunch with Laura or lunch with Laura. And this is a kind of a pilot project that I'm working on to see, you know, what the response is going to be. And I'm going to be coming on lunchtime during the week to talk about different topics that I think will hopefully you'll find relevant and important for, you know, women who are going through breakups and, you know, all the stuff that goes along with that. And so, um, we're going to be talking about moving past bitterness and regret after your breakup today. And you know, what's so important is, and you see me looking down because I have a couple of notes so I can stay on point. Okay. So what's really uh, important is people come to me and ask me, you know, Laura, you just got divorced or you got divorced a couple of years ago. How is it that it seems like you're just, you know, you don't have any fallout from it. <laughs> how, how is it that you seem, you know, so happy? And a lot of times when we get to around our age, you can figure out whether somebody's really faking it or not. And so people will kind of realize, you know, hey, what is that? I want that. And so in order to kind of put that, give you a framework for that, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of my background and what I went through and just give you a little bit of my testimony so you, you kind of understand. And this is really what I kind of help my clients to do. And so, you know, that came about not just because I woke up one morning and said, hey, everything's wonderful. I'm just going to live in peace and joy and happiness. No, <laughs> that came about from a lot of hard work, a lot of tears being shed um, and a lot of hard work. For me, it was beforehand. Now, bear in mind, I have kids, so my dynamics were a little bit different um, in that respect, but still a lot of things will apply to you. And so, you know, bear in mind that we didn't have any children. Um, but the work that I did beforehand was I got to a point where I, you know, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay. <laughs> and we all get there. Right. And then we realize, okay, does he want to make it any better? And so we tried to go through, you know, I tried to get him to go to counseling. He didn't believe in counseling. Thank you, Veronica. Yes, it is a process. It absolutely is a process, Veronica. And if you're watching live, feel free to type in the chat if you have any comments or if you're watching the tape version of this. Also, please just leave some comments, okay? I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so it was a lot of hard work before, and the point was I got to the point where I knew it was over, okay? And, and there's no real good way for me to kind of explain what that feels like or how you actually know other than you just feel it in your spirit. It drops in your spirit and you say, you know what, we, 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 this journey is over and it's not going to get any better. And so that's the best way I can explain it. It's just that you know in your heart that things aren't going to get better and it's time for you to move on. And for me, when I, in prayer, I just kind of sought a release from the Lord and I just felt like God was saying, yes, this this season of your life is over and so it's all right so it's number one you get to a point where you know it's over um, but you know just before that you know you you do what you feel is in your heart to do for me my journey was to continue to talk to him and ask him is, is there any changes you want to make we need to make a change you know it's possible for us to for this, for this relationship to get better and counseling was just out of the out of the realm of possibilities for him he just didn't believe in it and so, you know, there's, when there's no counseling, where else is there to go? There's just no place else to go. So I got to that point and just realizing, but before that, sometimes it, it, you have to come to a point where you look at the relationship, you kind of do a post-mortem. When you know it's over, you do a post-mortem, you start carving up the dead body, right? <laughs> oh, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? But, but that's what it is. <laughs> so you start carving up the dead body and you say, you know what, what happened here? How did I end up here? And, and for me, I had to also come to a point where I had to understand how I got there. And I said, what did I have in common with this man? <laughs> you know, you look years later and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I, how did I make that choice? And so that, number two, that was an important part. Number one is knowing that the relationship was over. Number two is realizing how you got there. And for me, how I got there, how did my concept of relationships get so distorted and perverted to be honest it, it was really distorted and perverted and it got to that point I had to look back in childhood I said you know how how did I form my ideas about relationships and about marriage and about men how did I how did that happen and so I looked back and I saw my story is a lot like a lot of other young girls unfortunately and, and more, increasingly more for boys too but when you look at it my, I come out of a, an experience of I was um, sexually violated when I was younger um, from the time that I was seven to the time I was 10. 
and that impression or that branding in my heart and in my mind about relationships about the dynamics of power in a relationship um, you know my view was oh my body is just to be used by somebody who's more powerful than me or and and you know real intimacy the way they talk about in the movies really doesn't exist that's just that's this fairy tale Hollywood you know Disneyland stuff so that that stuff got in, branded in my mind and that's how I started to look at relationships and also not to trust men specifically not to trust black men and you know a lot of times you know black men will say you know black women you know you always you guys are so hard you know you can't you know, you always want to be the man you don't trust nobody yeah a lot of it stems from childhood when we're violated and when we have this branding and abuse from men who look like us it's not from you know the white guy that lives down the corner no it's from men that looks like us men who are familiar with our families whether they are caretakers whether they're relatives whatever they are they are people who have access to us when we're children okay and so that may be the neighbor that's you know two houses down who says oh you know and in my experience was my parents got divorced when I was very young I was five and so you know your neighbors know dad's not there every day anymore you know the caretaker or the babysitter you know or the, the p person who is you know tutoring you knows hey dad's not in the house anymore and it's not that dad doesn't care but you know how hard it is at, you know as a parents now how hard it is to know what's going on with your kids when you sleep you know when they're sleeping in the in their room across the hall every night how it's more a lot more difficult to know what's going on with the kids when you don't live with them anymore and so that's what happened with me you know my dad wasn't living with us anymore I missed him terribly he was still very in involved in our lives you know he always came for a you know for a visitation um, you know all those things so he was an involved dad but it was, it was hard for him and so so just know that okay I came to that branding so that way I ended up growing up I was an angry teenager okay you know and I was you know the the ultra you know I'm not gonna rely on any man and I'm gonna get my own and I'm gonna get my education and, and all that's great education is great you know being able to know why you're on the planet and fulfill that destiny and walk in your calling through your career and all that that's great I'm not speaking against that at all but for me it was coming from a point of anger and bitterness because of the branding that had happened to me and realize too it's it's it's, it's classic textbook that's what the enemy does he goes in he tries to skew your view of what love and relationship is because God is love right so he hates God if he hates God he hates us right and so he always tries to find a way to distort and twist so that we're we're so involved in our mess you know the the sewage that he wants us to live in right that we don't end up fulfilling our debt our call in our lives we don't end up fulfilling the relationships that God intends for us to have which is a loving intimate relationship with someone who just loves us from head to toe and loves us just for who we are and to take care of us um, and us to take care of them you know it's, it's, it's a circle you know it's, 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 it's you know give and take on both sides I'm not saying that the guy does everything and the woman just sits back and says you know hey you know I got it like that <laughs> I mean you know that's, that's wonderful you know, we want our, our men to dote on us uh, dote on us but you know there's there's that return of us taking care of them you know looking after them you know just doing all the things taking care of them like nobody can nobody else can you know not their moms not anybody um, and that just means you know just emotionally and physically <laughs> you know all that good stuff that God wanted to bless us with you know because sex is a, is a blessing from God you know it's, it's us that really perverts it and makes it yucky and, and, and ugh. But you know, in a, in a context of a loving relationship, it is absolutely beautiful and absolute gift to us. But that got perverted for me. You know, the sex ended up being something that was bad and hurtful and, you know, something that I'm to be afraid of and, you know, all that stuff, you know, and I, I'm just being real transparent today. <laughs> I'm just being real transparent, so bear with me because this is a little scary, okay? <laughs> but, but if I can help one lady out there, if she's listening to my story if I can help one young lady out there it's it's worth it it's worth me bearing my soul it's worth me being very transparent and very vulnerable because I feel very naked and vulnerable right now <laughs> so hang in there with me um, so it was really realizing what did I have in common with him 
he was also a very, uh, he was seven years older than me, but he was also a very angry young man from the stuff that happened in his past. And unfortunately, what we, we did have in common was we were both violated when we were young. He was violated also. He, I could never get him to talk about it, but he was violated too. And so that's what we had in common. We were very angry by the branding that the enemy tried to, to put on our lives. And so I was like, okay, that's how I ended up making that choice. And, and you know, he also had very um, untraditional ideas about marriage and about, you know, you know, women, you know, you guys do whatever you want to do. I'm still kind of acting like a single guy because, you know, you black women, you know, you're you like men anyway. And you, you, you make your own income. You're going to split everything in half, even though I make two or three times more than you do. We're still going to split the bills in half. So that way, you know, he's only still make, paying half of his income, but I'm still struggling at even though I'm only making a third of what he does. And you do the math on that, you figure out that doesn't work. <laughs> so that way he can use the rest of his income to go and play, you know, and do what he wanted to do and act like a single man. That's what that ended up being, that was my marriage <laughs> for 19 years. <laughs> oh, as sad as that was. Um, but that probably the smartest thing that I did, even though I love children, but I knew in the context of that relationship, it wasn't a good idea to become a parent. And I was right. Even though I'm very involved with my nieces and nephews, I love them. I love kids. I've, you know, I've been involved with big brothers and big sisters. You know, I pour into kids' lives, even though I don't have to. Um, but I love them. So don't get me wrong. I love kids. I just, I just knew it wasn't right for me to have kids in my in my own marriage. Okay, moving on, because I know we just have lunch time. <laughs> All right, so that was that was a major thing. So number one was knowing the relationship with Dover. Number two is realizing how you made the choices that you did. And then number three was forgiving myself for those, some of the, the my part in it and the choices that I made because, you know, he didn't put a gun to my head and make me walk down the aisle. He just didn't. <laughs> and so I had to list, I had to come to a place where I had to forgive myself for the choices and for the time that I spent. And one of the major things that women struggle with after they break up, whether it's a long-term relationship or an actual divorce is, oh, I'm regretting that I shouldn't have, I should have did this five years ago. I should have did this 10 years ago. I would have been 10 years younger going into the dating scene, going into, you know, starting my career or starting my life or whatever it is. And that is that heavy sense of regret that I want to speak to right now and to, just to just say, you know, God doesn't want you to live there. And I had to get to the point where I had to move beyond that and start realizing that God knows the end from the beginning. He knew that I would wait 19 years to get a divorce. He knew that. He knew that before the foundation of the world, right? So I let that sink in. He knew that before the foundation of the world. He, he knows everything. And so he knew I would be right here, right now. That's how all powerful he is. You know, he, he, he hangs all the stars and calls them by name. Trillions and trillions of stars, he calls them by name. So just keep that in mind how powerful God is. And that really helps you to get over the regret. Because God, you know, he's still, the plans that he has for you are still good. You still have a lot to do, you know, for the kingdom. And so let that meditate in your mind and in your spirit. Let it brand in your heart to help you to get over any type of regret of not letting go earlier because you're ready when you're ready right you're ready when you're ready so forgive yourself look yourself in the if, it, if it, you have to look at yourself in the mirror every morning and say hey you know i i am today is a new day it's not too late for me and i'm moving forward now moving forward in boldness and in strength so that's number three so I had to do those things as I was deciding to file for divorce and also those things when I was actually going through my divorce. Now, since I didn't have kids and since, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of property, pretty much all we were doing was dividing debt, okay? <laughs> so my divorce was kind of quick. Um, it, only, it only took about four months. Um, you know, I, and I understand as a, as a family law attorney here in Texas for 13 years, I know when you have kids, things can get a lot more, you know, complicated. It's not more moving parts. So... Um, sometimes it may take six months, nine months, maybe even up to a year if you have, you know, significant amount of property that you have to divide. If you have, you know, retirement accounts that you have to, you know, divide and figure out what percentage goes where and all that good stuff. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I'm just kind of giving you my own testimony. Okay. So then afterwards, after my divorce is over, how do you move beyond bitterness? You know, I really have to address that and to say, you know, I met my ex when I was 17 and so 
up from the time I was 17 until two years ago. You know, that's all my adult life that I spent with him, you know, and I didn't have a whole lot of dating, you know, experience beforehand. And so I'm like going into, <laughs> you know, this whole dating scene and, and learning the new vocabulary that people use about dating and relationships and, you know, what's what. And, you know, it was a little scary, a little intimidating for me. And I had to say, you know what? Yes, I've spent my entire adult life with this person, but I'm not going to have bitterness about that. And, and let me just tell you how I work through that. Working through bitterness, number, number one, is seeing things from a different perspective. Now, what does that mean? That means I had to look back and say, you know, God gave us free will. And, and we all have assignments. We have assignments that are for us, that the plans that God has for us for, that are for us and good for us, that give us hope in the future. And then we have assignments that the enemy has, the assignments are, that are against us. And I had an adult in my life when I was being abused who came into agreement with an assignment that was against me. You know, and, and he did that for a whole host of his own reasons from, you know, his you know, negative experiences, excuse me, his negative experiences that he had when, you know, he was a child and all that stuff. I'm not making excuses for him, um, even though, you know, I can look at him, I can close my eyes and see his face and pray a blessing over him. That took a whole lot of hard work. Um, but I had an adult in my life who, took, who came into agreement for an assignment against me, against other family members too, but against me. And so I had to say, okay, I had to look at it and take, take it from a different perspective and look at it from the spiritual realm and what's going on in the spirit. Because I honestly believe the spiritual realm is, is more real than me, you know, touching this, touching the chair that I'm sitting on, touching this table that's in front of me um, and say, okay, let's just take this battle to the spirit realm where it belongs. And I am going to pray that, you know, the end, no more can the enemy steal from me, steal my joy, steal my happiness steal my um, enthusiasm for the future and the plans that God has for me. And so hear that. Say, say to yourself, no more can the enemy steal from me. I'll look and say, okay, this person came into agreement with an assignment that was against me. And um, I'm going to pray for um, healing for that person. I pray that, that person has a change uh, and a shift and healing in them so that they don't hurt anybody else. I had, to, I had to come to that and speak that over that particular person and pray for them and say, God, change their mind, change their heart because they have a whole lot of, um, they're oppressed. They're, they are oppressed by the stronghold that is ruling and reigning over their lives and I pray for freedom from that so that they don't hurt anybody else. So that stronghold is not in control of who they are and who they plug into as far as their identity and their behavior. Um, so I had, to, I had to come to a place where I had to forgive them and speak a blessing over the person who took an assignment against me. And, and when you look at it that way, I'm not saying it takes all the emotion out of it, but it really puts you into a higher perspective and say, hmm. And it also helps you to recognize other people who have assignments against you. Pray for them, but turn and run like hell. <laughs> and make sure that they don't get a foothold in your life. So, and, and so that's twofold. That's, those are the two ways that, those, the, the, that really understanding the assignments against you really helps you. Helps you to see it coming from other people and it helps you to be free to move on and be released from that pain and a lot of the just uh, emotional wounding that happened. Um, and so if, 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 if this resonates with you, if you were abused when you were a young girl, I was looking up statistics from the, uh, disease, the Center for Disease Control and it says one out of four girls before the age of 18 will be sexually violated in some way, whether it's molestation, whether it's actual rape, whether it's exposure to um, um, violent pornography or any combination of those things um, they are violated in some way they are defiled in some way because that's really what it is I don't think defiled is too strong a language they are defiled in some way so if that's that's you just know that you are not alone and actually one out of six boys are also being sexually violated in some way and that really makes an impression on us about relationships and about marriage um, and, and about how we view ourselves, you know, because I accepted what was less than God's best for me when I chose my ex as a husband. And I had to forgive myself for that. 
And I, I, you know, when you do that, you teach people, you teach people how to treat you. And I had to forgive myself for teaching my ex that, you know, his views that, you know, cheating isn't really cheating, and <laughs> you know, a lot of all the activities that he was involved with, that I put up with, that I forgive myself for that part of it. And um, just pray for him that he's no longer involved in all that muckety muck and that he's, you know, God has really just encountered him in a mighty way. Um, and so to, and also know too, afterwards I had to, and I still in, in some a level of working through with a counselor, breaking old patterns, breaking old um, thought patterns that leads to the same results. I don't want to end up choosing a guy just like my ex. <laughs> That I think, you know, oh, I can fix him or, you know what, I'll take the lead. I'll be the one always suggesting to go to church and I'll be the one suggesting, you know, let's make a budget and I'll be the one, okay, let's make a plan for the next 18 months. No, no, that's not that for me. I have a more, I have a more traditional view of relationships. And so I am, no, he's going to be the guy. <laughs> I'm going to be the girl. You know, I, I just want to be the girl. Can I, can I just be the girl? <laughs> I just want to be the girl in relationship. I want to be covered. I want to have someone who's going to be a spiritual covering for me, who's going to be a financial covering for me. That doesn't mean that I don't contribute. But if you want to be a stay-at-home mom, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. And I'm sick and tired of stay-at-home moms feeling a sense of shame and embarrassment for that. If you can do that, and if you want to do that, do that. Being a mom is the hardest job in the world. It honestly is. You know, rearing up young people to be responsible adults who will walk in the fullness of God's plans for them is the hardest job on the planet. And I applaud you, especially if you're a single mom, I applaud you because it's hard. And I'm sick and tired also of people jumping on single moms saying that, oh, well, you made a mistake and you're a drag on society. And whatever. No, you are the fabric of society. You are the person that keeps the glue of society. You are the one that keeps all the wheels and all the moving parts moving. So, and don't you forget it. And don't you let anybody else tell you anything different. Period. The end. Because <laughs> I said so. <laughs> no, anyway. All right. So, in closing, I'm actually, I'm actually finishing up here. Sorry. Let me just look up my notes again. I'm not here to fix anybody. And actually, I made a mistake again after I got divorced by, you know, a gentleman who started to pursue me, who, you know, had a whole bunch of problems that I need to get involved with that wasn't a part of God's plan and God's walk for my life. Um, but I ended up getting a little bit entangled in that. So I had to check myself and say, okay, you know, that's, I'm going back into old thought patterns. I can't do that anymore because it's not good for my own emotional health and it's not a part of God's plans for me. So make sure that, you know, you're starting to see, oh, that's a trigger for me. And I can't, I can't go down that road. And if that person is showing those types of character traits, you speak a blessing over them and keep it moving, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I can't fix anybody and I can't be the leader in the relationship. Those are the two things as far as my testimony is concerned that I had to really grapple with and work through and make sure that I'm changing my thoughts. I'm changing, I'm, ca I'm, I'm capturing every thought and making it obedient to Christ. And every time that, you know, the, the enemy tries to, um, the enemy tries to bring condemnation on me. Oh, Lord, you spent, you wasted 19 years. You wasted this, you wasted that. All the money that he wasted, you know, he made, you know, because my ex used to make a good living. We don't have a daggone thing to show for it. <laughs> but, you know, I had to forgive myself for that. You know, every time the enemy tries to bring condemnation, I cast every thought and say, you know, Jesus, I cast it to the foot of the cross. That's yours. And, you know, there's no condemnation. I'm still moving forward. I'm still healthy. I'm still, I have so many giftings and talents that people appreciate and want and need. And know that for yourself, you have so many giftings and talents. Thank you, Marvetta. Yes, more women do need to hear this. Absolutely. Uh, you have giftings and talents and wonderful things to give to the world, to give to your children, to give to your family members, your extended family, but people you come into contact with, with this, you just at the grocery store, you know, that sometimes, you know, you'll struck, you know, you end up striking up a conversation with someone and, you know, You'll be you're like, you know, you, you'll walk away from them and you'll, you know, sometimes you don't realize the impact that you can make on somebody. Even just smiling in someone's direction when they're just, you know, this came from home, they're just going through hell. Sometimes just smiling in someone's direction. I've, I've, I've experienced that where I was just going through it with my ex and just had another young lady, you know, didn't matter if she was, you know, African American, Chinese, 
Hispanic, didn't matter. You know, she would smile in my direction and it would just almost bring me to tears. And I'd be, you know, in the middle of Kroger's, you know, or in the middle of pumping gas and somebody just smile and saying, you know, hey, how you doing? Just keep walking off. Sometimes you don't know the impact that you have. Just being authentic you. <laughs> so those are the ways that I hope that um, you can bring it to, sorry. <laughs> those are some of the ways that I hope that you can realize that you can move forward past bitterness and, and forgiveness is for you it's freedom for you it's not a rubber stamp saying what they said or what they did was okay because it's not um, and it doesn't necessarily mean they get a pass either because if some people need to go to jail they need to go to jail okay but that doesn't mean that you uh, that doesn't mean that I speak war curses over them you know wishing that they go to hell and whatever you know because you know if we really have a good understanding of what hell is we would never want anybody to go over there not our worst enemy not Hitler to go to hell as how awful it is. So I always try to make sure that I don't end up, you know, going to that place where I start speaking angry words over people. And so, you know, if you keep your words in agreement with heaven, you know, you, you keep a, a, a perspective saying, okay, you know, this is a person that's taking an assignment against me, whether it's somebody at work who's talking bad about you, you know, and, and who's trying to throw you under the bus, you know, just look at look at them from that higher perspective and say, okay, you know, and then pray for them. I had, just a quick point, I had a young lady who was trying to injure me every way that she could financially. You know, she just, she just had it out for a different reason. This is related to one of my family law cases. You know, she didn't like the fact that I was the attorney representing on the other side. And she just tried to do everything that she could to injure me financially. And I got to the point where I stopped speaking bad words over her and I started praying for her. And I tell you the truth, I did nothing. But there was a shift in that case where the things started going in our favor. And it wasn't something, you know, great, you know, it wasn't great lawyering on my part, even though I, you know, I've been a family law attorney here for 13 years. It wasn't great lawyering on my part. That was God. <laughs> so if you want to take the fight to the spiritual realm and start speaking blessings, and when you start speaking blessings, God starts heaping uh, coals, heaping coals uh, of just on their head, the hot coals on their head. And that's not for punishment, that's for you know, purification of their mind. That's really what they want, you know. I I want to see that young lady who's trying to injure me financially. I want to see her in heaven, you know, because the bottom line is, if we're all believers, you know. By the time we get to heaven, we're not gonna remember what the heck we were fussing about to begin with, right? You know. And I honestly believe, I hope that I see my ex in heaven. I want to see him there. I don't want him to be separated from God forever. That's just that 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 is the definition of hell to be separated from God forever for eternity. And so I hope that 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 brings you some comfort some level of freedom and understanding that it's okay to forgive. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, you're giving a rubber stamp for, the, for what the person did. It's freedom for you to move on in boldness and in strength and in positivity to fulfill God's plans and purposes for you. So thank you for watching. I'll be here tomorrow, same time at 12 noon. I'm not sure what the topic is. I'll pray about that. But it'll be something related to you know, you know what women experience during their breakup and and divorce and kids, and I might also start to talk about you know blending families because I you know I I was part of a blended family for a while, <laughs> and just some of the things that I find helpful, even from just drawing from experience, just from some of my cases, that I think that would be relevant and helpful to you. If you if you found this helpful, please just shoot me an email at clientcare at how to move on after divorce .com or you can leave a comment in the chat here. I'd love to hear from you. Have a, enjoy the rest of your lunch and have a great day.